Well, it is indeed to the cross that we come this morning, and we do pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us in our hearts to see more of what our Savior has done for us. Do have your Bibles open uh, at Mark chapter 15, and we're looking this morning at verses 16 through to 32. Verses 16 through to 32. Well, why did Jesus die? What did his, his death achieve for all those who trust in him? There's no more important question in all the world, is there? It's a crucial question for you this morning if you've not put your faith in Jesus. Why should I trust him? What does his death do for me? It's a crucial one also for those of us who know the Lord. We rely on Jesus and his death alone for our salvation, don't we? And it's the work of Christ which gives us certainty and comfort and assurance in good times and bad times. And if we want to tell others about what Jesus has done, we always need to be growing in our understanding of what the cross means so that we can share it with others more effectively. Now, when you first read Mark's account of the crucifixion, and perhaps particularly today's passage, it, it can seem that he's simply reporting events, doesn't, can't it? It seems as though he doesn't give us much explanation. Certainly, there aren't little asides explaining what's going on and the theological significance of his death. And so we can be tempted to think, well, if I really want to understand the cross, I need to go to the epistles and see what they say. Now, we need to go to the epistles. They're full of rich theology, and they're very important for understanding Jesus' death. But actually, Mark's narrative gives us a lot more than we might think at first glance. It's constantly pointing us to what the cross means, as, as do all the Gospels. Mark's Gospel doesn't do this by adding in those explanatory notes that we might sort of ask for. Rather, it's what Mark includes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his narrative and how he reports it. That's what gives us the explanation. I think the gospel is deliberately and consciously explaining the cross to us as we go along. Last week we saw that, didn't we, in the way that Barabbas and Jesus are clearly set out. Barabbas, the guilty sinner. Jesus, the spotless substitute. And yet Jesus dies in Barabbas' place, just as Jesus is our substitute when we trust him taking our punishment, and we go free. This week, we move on to Jesus' mockery and to the cross itself. What are the pointers to interpretation here? Well, one certainly is that Mark is referring us back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament connections are crucial. Jesus is fulfilling the, the prophes prophes prophecies rather, about the Messiah. Mark wants us to see that. We'll pick that up as we go along. But secondly, and I think actually rather startlingly, we see that Mark's gospel interprets Jesus' death through the attacks and the insults of his opponents. Today's verses say very little about Jesus' physical pain and suffering, the blood and the agony, the, suffering, the, the suffocating struggle of Christ on the cross as he fought to his breath in pain. But that's not really described at all. It's assumed the readers would have known what crucifixion was, but much more prominent are the actions of the soldiers and Pilate, the mocking crowds, the chief priests. And so our plan this morning is to understand what the actions and words of Jesus' opponents show us about the meaning of the cross. We are, in other words, this morning going to see the wonder of the cross as described by Jesus' enemies. The wonder of the cross described by Jesus' enemies. Now, I could have had seven or eight points here. I've restricted myself to five. Just five, okay? <laughs> what does the cross achieve for Christ's people? What does it achieve for us if we've trusted in Jesus? Number one, the king is mocked that we might be accepted. The king is mocked that we might be accepted. In verse 15, in the last week's passage, Jesus was sent away to be scourged. This was a, a brutal beating, beating with a whip, a whip that contained sharp pieces of bone and metal that would tear someone's back to shreds and create great pain and agony. Sometimes um, 
criminals um, being punished that way died before they got any further. That's how brutal the, the scourging was. So Jesus' back has been ripped to shreds. And now weak, he's taken, in verse 16, into the hall called the Praetorium. And he's mocked by all the soldiers who were there. The garrison here, the, 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 the original word there is cohort. And that would technically refer to 600 soldiers. So there may have been as many as 600 soldiers here mocking Jesus. And however many they were, these soldiers are keen to have some cruel fun, aren't they? Here's a condemned man. He thinks he's a king. But even his so-called people reject him. What kind of king's that? We're going to have fun with him. Gruesome. So they take, his, take him and they put a robe over his body, his bloody body, purple robe. Perhaps it was a, a faded scarlet soldier's garment turned purple. They put a crown they'd made out of thorns on his head. They hid him with a reed, a reed that was, would be intended to be a scepter. He'd have looked like a desperate, weak, sad imitation of a king. They hit him. They spit on him. It's vile, isn't it? And they bow down to him mockingly, smirking, as if to a king. And as we look on, we might recall the words of Isaiah chapter 50, speaking of the the suffering servant, the coming saviour. Isaiah 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Or Isaiah 53, again the suffering servant, in verse 7. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He takes the mocking. He takes the spitting. Quietly. But for those of us who understand who Jesus is and believe who he is, don't we want to call out to these soldiers? Don't we wish we could intervene? Don't you know who this man is, we'd want to say to them? This one you dress up as some parody of a king. This man you bow down and mock. Don't you know that this man in this pathetic outfit, this man is the king of kings. He's the ruler of the universe. And as you laugh at him, don't you realise that one day you'll see this king coming on the clouds in great glory. One day you'll see him in true kingly splendour. And on that day, you'll bow down, not with a smirk on your face, but you will bow down in worship and awe and fear. On that day, you won't laugh at him and judge him, but he will judge you. And he will hold you to account for your sin. Do you not realize who this is? But they don't realize. Indeed, they must not realize. Why not? Isaiah 53 goes on to tell us why. They must not realize because my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus must be mocked, and he must go and be crucified that he might bear his people's sin, that he might justify them, declare them righteous, so that when he comes as judge, his people will be welcomed and not condemned. He must be mocked by these soldiers if he is to justify many. And you know these soldiers, we don't know their story after this, but they could have been saved if later they put their faith in Jesus. And maybe some of them did. We simply don't know. But it is perfectly possible that some of those soldiers will stand before Christ on that last day and they'll say, because he accepted mocking from me, I'm accepted by him. We don't know. But they were free to come and trust in Christ, just as we are. Friends, this morning, if you've trusted in Jesus, then this mocking is for you. This cruelty was for your forgiveness. The King of Kings was mocked to bring you to God. How will you respond this morning? Will you look on in wonder, thankfulness, and trust? 
if you've not trusted in Jesus, and even if you've been a mocker of God's people, even if you've always laughed at Jesus till now, if you've, even if you've always brushed him off, yet you are freely called to come to him and receive his forgiveness. He receives mockers. He receives those who reject him. He receives those who spurn him. He calls you today. Come and trust me. And when you do so, you can be certain that when he comes as judge, you will not be condemned, but you will be accepted and welcomed. The king is mocked that we might be accepted. Secondly, the king is crucified to establish his kingdom. The king is crucified to establish his kingdom. After his mocking, they put Jesus' clothes back on him. Soon after, he's taken to Golgotha, to the place of the skull, to Calvary, to be crucified. Now, this is outside of the city, and Jesus is expected to carry his cross, or at least the, the cross beam, um, to the place where he'd be crucified. But he's unable, and so the soldiers co-opt a man, as they're entitled to do under Roman law, Simon, a Cyrenian, and he carries it for him. Jesus is then offered sour wine, and that's... Uh, uh, um, in fulfillment of Psalm 69, verse 21. They strip him of his clothes. They divide up the clothes between them, and for the larger cloak, they cast lots. And there they're fulfilling Psalm 22, in verse 18, which says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And so we just note that the Scripture is fulfilled. Now he's nailed to the cross. They lift him up, and they put nails through his hands and his feet. And above his head, they put an inscription. It's a description of his crime. The king of the Jews. That's what it says, the king of the Jews. The man is killed as a king. And I guess we don't quite know what Herod's motivation were in putting that up there, but certainly to anyone going past, it would have said, this is what happens to anyone who sets themselves up against the Roman authorities. You call yourself a king this is what we do to you. This man thought he was a king, but he's not on a throne, he's on a cross. He's not reigning, he's dying. It was mockery, wasn't it? It was a statement of Rome's strength and his weakness. Not much of a king, this. Look at him. And yet, and yet, by lifting Jesus up and writing that inscription, the Roman authorities, Pilate, is saying something deeply profound about Jesus' death. Jesus' lifting up on the cross is not the failure of his kingdom. No, it's the establishment of his kingdom. In John chapter 12 and verse 31, Jesus speaks about his death and he says this, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth will draw all peoples to myself. I'm lifted up on a cross, I'll draw all peoples to myself. You see, Jesus here at Calvary is establishing a kingdom, isn't he? He's establishing a kingdom. That's, good. That's his great work of men and women, boys and girls from all across the world, from all backgrounds, all circumstances. He's been drawing his chosen people to himself in ever-increasing numbers over the last 2,000 years, and he continues to add to that kingdom today. The gospel's gone out into every corner of the earth. And more and more people are being brought into it. But how are people drawn to Christ? It's through the message of Christ crucified, isn't it? It's only because the king was lifted up on a cross that we have a gospel to preach. It's only the preaching of the cross today that will draw men and women and boys and girls here in Shepshed into the kingdom of the crucified king. You see, Pilate didn't get this, I don't think, not totally anyway. But when he lifted up Jesus on the cross and put that sign above his head, King of the Jews, he displayed Jesus, establishing his kingdom through his death for all the world to see. And it's that same crucified King that all need to see today. 
So Christian brothers and sisters here, will you preach the cross to your friends and your neighbours? Will we tell them of a saviour lifted up so that they may enter the kingdom? And will we worship the crucified king in wonder and awe, thanking him that every day he's bringing people into his glorious eternal kingdom? The king is mocked that we might be accepted. The king is crucified to establish his kingdom. Thirdly, Jesus is counted a transgressor so that we might be counted innocent. Jesus is counted a transgressor so that we might be counted innocent. In verse 27, we see that Jesus is crucified, not alone as some kind of special case, but he's crucified between two robbers. Probably these were rebels or insurrectionists. That would have been a crime that would have earned crucifixion. Perhaps they were even Barabbas' fellow rebels that he was chained to before. Well, we don't know that. Could have been, though. And when we think of Jesus crucified alongside two ordinary criminals. We think, what an insult that was to him, don't we? Imagine what people thought of him as they passed by. Look at those three. How disgraceful. Those awful criminals. They've got what they deserve. Jesus, who's never done a single thing wrong, is held guilty by association and by the disgraceful death. And it's terrible, isn't it, to be considered guilty when you're innocent? Simon told us a few weeks back about some of those serious miscarriages of justice that took place in the 20th century. I've not been through that. Hopefully none of you have. I think the worst case of injustice I've ever known is being given a detention at school for something that someone else did. But even that hurts, doesn't it? When when we get treated unfairly, it's painful. Can you imagine how much it would have hurt for Jesus who lived a perfect life of obedience to be considered guilty in the eyes of the world and cursed. And yet, and yet, by putting him alongside two criminals on a cross, Pilate is unwittingly pointing towards a crucial truth. Because in another sense, it is right that Jesus should be here. Let's go back a minute to Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 12 is quoted here in verse 28. He was numbered with the transgressors, but the longer verse again reads like this. And and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Why was it appropriate that Jesus hung on the cross with two criminals? It was because he bore the sins of many. In Isaiah, the word there literally means lifted. He lifted off the sins of many. How did he do that? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him, God made him, who knew no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus literally bore our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, to lift the sin from off of us, counted God, Oh, God, to lift the sin off of us, rather, counted our sin as Jesus' sin. It was imputed to him. He was made sin for us. He was counted as a sinner in God's sight. And therefore, as a sinner, he was rightly numbered with the transgressors, bearing our sin. And then with his sin, with our sin on his shoulders, he went to take our punishment. If we've trusted Jesus, therefore, we cannot be considered guilty in God's sight, before God's court. We can't. On the day of judgment, when Christ returns, we will not be numbered with the transgressors. Because Jesus has been numbered with the transgressors for us. And today, though we often sin, We ought never to walk around with a weight of guilt on our shoulders. We ought never to wander around wondering in the end if God would punish us and condemn us to hell. We should never fear that. The innocent Jesus took our sin upon himself. He bore it away, and we're justified, cleared of all guilt. 
Pilate unjustly sent Jesus to die with the work of criminals. And yet he was pointing towards God's saving work. For Jesus was numbered with the transgressors, bearing our sin, that we would never be numbered with the transgressors. God counted his servant sinful, that we might be forgiven. So the king is mocked, that we might be accepted. The king is crucified to establish his kingdom. Jesus is counted as a transgressor, that we might be counted innocent. Fourthly, God's temple is destroyed to bring us into God's presence. Now we're back with what we were thinking about with the children earlier. As Jesus hung on the cross, he received insults from all directions. you think pity would be more appropriate, wouldn't you? But even after he was hung on the cross, they continued to mock him and throw abuse at him. We're not surprised by that. It's just what God's word said would happen. In Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, we read these words from the mouth of Jesus himself through David. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And then Mark has recorded for us the insults of some passers-by, and there's similarities here. Listen, verse 29 of Mark 15. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. They shake their head at him and they throw this at him. You who destroy the temple and build it in three days. Now that accusation, well, he's heard that before recently as Jesus because it was used at the, at the, the trial before the Sanhedrin. Jesus' words, though, are being mixed up, aren't they? In what he, he didn't say, I will destroy the temple and, you, and build it again in three days. He said, you destroy the temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And of course, they've misunderstood the context, or they've chosen not to notice it. Back in John chapter 2, early on in Jesus' ministry, Jesus has just cleared the temple of, of, of sellers and money changers for the first time. He's going to do it again in the last week before his death. But this was the first time. And when he does it, the Jews say to Jesus, this is John chapter 2, verse 18, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Off you go clearing the temple and causing chaos. Give us a sign. Why why are you doing that? And Jesus answers and says, well, this will be the sign, in effect. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What's he talking about? It's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But John tells us in his gospel, he was speaking of the temple of his body, not the temple building in Jerusalem, but his flesh. Jesus was showing, you see, that the temple building was a type. It was a symbol of Jesus himself. The temple, as we were thinking earlier, was the place of God's dwelling with his people in the Old Testament. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. The temple was the place where a priest sacrificed animals so that people could draw near to God. You couldn't come to the temple without sacrifice. But those animal sacrifices... They were only pictures, and they all pointed to Jesus. Jesus, the true sacrifice for sin. Destroy my body, he says to the Jews, and they will, on the cross. Destroy me, he's saying, as that true sacrifice. And it's Christ's sacrifice, isn't it, that opens the way for sinful human beings to draw near to God. And then Jesus, having been sacrificed, will do exactly what he promised. He will raise it up. He will raise up on the third day from the dead. You see the point? The crowds here are mocking him for his apparently ridiculous comment. But they fail to understand that his very hanging on the cross is that destruction of the temple that he talked about. They fail to understand that even as they laugh at him, he is dying as the sacrifice for sin. He is being destroyed as the true temple so that free access to God may be offered to all who trust in him. The way to God is open. We'll explore this more next week, but that's the big point. The way to God is open because Jesus died. And if you're not yet a Christian, if you haven't come in faith, you might wonder, well, is it really open 
for me? Am I maybe too much of a failure for God to accept me? You might worry that you've lived too many years rejecting God. You've been too sinful. Not the right kind of person for him to receive you. But that's not true. Whoever you are, whatever your history, whatever you've done, the way is open for you to come to God. Because it doesn't depend on you at all. It depends on Christ's sacrifice. Because the true temple, Jesus, was put to death on the cross, because he bore his people's sin, you can come simply in faith, trusting in Jesus, regardless of what you've said, regardless of what you've done, regardless of how you've failed, regardless of what you've failed to do. It doesn't matter. You could be the worst criminal in the history of the planet. You can come because it isn't about what you've done. It's about what Jesus did in dying to open up the way to God. The way is open. Christian friends, you need never worry on any day whether or not God will accept you. You never need to think in the morning, I don't feel worthy enough today to draw near to him in prayer. I don't feel good enough to come to church. I've failed so much this week. You never need to think that your recent sin is too great for you to come to a holy God. Of course, all sin would cut us off from God. But Jesus has died that you and I may come freely to the Father on good days and bad days. Days when we're struggling with our sin days when we're full of anxieties and struggles and doubts. On those days we can come, just as any other day. And on those days we must come. The way is open. It's not about you, it's about him. He died to bring us to God. The way is open. Friends, come. Come to Jesus. He died. The way is open. God's temple destroyed to bring us into God's presence. So what have we seen? The king is mocked that we might be accepted. The king is crucified to establish his kingdom. Jesus is counted as a transgressor that we might be counted innocent. God's temple has been destroyed to bring us into God's presence. And fifthly and lastly, Jesus saves us by not saving himself. Jesus saves us by not saving himself. Well, Jesus was being mocked by the passing crowds. But now here come the chief priests, the architects of Jesus' arrest and trial and execution. And we might think, well, haven't they done enough already? They've got him put to death. What more could they want? But they want one last go at him. They want to give him a little bit more abuse. They want to um, um, sort of revel in what they've done. And they come then with a final taunt. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we might see and believe. Those are scornful words, aren't they? Hateful words. They're saying that here's the one who went around offering salvation to others. Here's the one who claimed to forgive sins. Here's the one who arrogantly called people to put their faith in him. Claimed to be God. But look at him. Can't even get himself out of this mess. He can't be the Christ. He can't be a king and die on the cross. Come down, Jesus, and then maybe we'll believe in you. But they wouldn't, and they don't. They're mocking him, aren't they? He saved others. He cannot save himself. That's a sneer, isn't it? It's a joke. But it's far truer than they know. Can Jesus save himself? Well, certainly he has the power to come down from the cross. He's the Son of God. He has the means to come down to the cross. He can call on all of heaven's armies if he wants to, can't he? But in another sense, they are absolutely right. He cannot come down. He cannot save himself because he's utterly committed to be the saviour of others. 
Remember what he said back in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, one of the most important verses in the book. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. How does Jesus save others? By giving his life as a ransom, by bearing their shame, by taking on himself their sin, by being their sacrifice to open up the way to God. That's how he does it. We're by nature sinners, aren't we? We're condemned in the sight of God on the way to hell, and we cannot be saved from that sin, from that condemnation, from that destination, unless Jesus dies. He cannot save himself or his people will perish. He cannot save himself, or his promise, his commitment is broken. He cannot save himself, because God's saving plan, made in all eternity, must be completed. He cannot save himself, because he loves us, his people, so dearly. His heart is rich and deep, with wonderful, mysterious, unchanging, unending love for me, for you. That's why he can't save himself. Because he must save the people he loves with an everlasting love. And how wonderful that is, isn't it? How staggering. Haven't the chief priests spoken a truth deeper than they have even the faintest idea of? He saves others. Himself he cannot save. He cannot save himself because he will save us. What did the cross achieve for all who trust in Jesus? Because the king was mocked, we're accepted. Because he was lifted up, we are welcomed into his kingdom. Because he was counted as a transgressor, we are counted innocent. Because as God's true temple, he was destroyed, we are welcomed into God's presence. Because he would not save himself, we are saved. So what about you this morning? Is that true for you? Do you know that all of that was for you? If you've not yet come, One last time, will you come this morning and put your faith in him? Trust your life to him. He's done everything. You simply have to believe. If you are a believer, will you praise your saviour with joy and wonder in your hearts this morning for all the cross has achieved for you? And will you come back to this cross in moments of doubt, when you're feeling guilty, when you're feeling discouraged, Will you come and find peace and assurance and certainty and love in the cross of Christ? And will we make every effort to tell those who haven't heard, who don't know him, will we make every effort to tell them about a saviour who stayed on a cross in order that he might offer them salvation and certain access into God's presence and joy forever? Will we do that? Amen.